years ago. Wow, really? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't sure who you were talking to there. How for are a you? Should I start doing <laughs> Yes, now? thank you. Gesticulate, woman, for the love of God. I'm well, thank you. Hello, audience. Good morning, Anne. Um, let's turn a little Quinn down. Um, so when my mother gets on or sees this, she's going to be shocked at what inspired today's talk. That's why I put it in the title. Uh, my mother loves Anne Lamott. Anne Lamott kind of makes me crazy town because she's such a friggin' mess. I mean, we're all messes. <laughs> don't get me wrong. But she's the kind of mess where she'll say things like, um, so obviously she's a writer and she teaches writing, and she'll say things in her book books like, um, ask someone you trust if they'll read a draft of your work. And if they don't, Remember that you've never liked them anyway, and then go out to the car and try not to cry till you get to the car, and then spiral out of control. But as you're spiraling out of control, remember that you love Cheetos, and then think about the Cheetos that live in the back seat of the car. And when you get to the, I mean, she's like if you give a mouse a cookie. Yeah, there's a on LSD and something that would speed you up. I mean, I don't know. My drug paraphernalia and and uh, referencing is limited since I've never done any of them. But no, I think we can all agree that's a powerful message. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> she makes me a little bit berserk. But I am, uh, a book of hers was in my bookcase. And I was curious that I have it, because I don't like her. And then I realized, much to my embarrassment, that this is a book from my friend Mary that she got from a friend in 1999. So I thought, well, all right, I'll read the book and then I'll give it back to her. Sorry, Mary. Sorry, it's coming back. I'm almost done. Okay, but today I read, I think, maybe the most extraordinary sentence I've maybe <laughs> ever, ever, ever read. So we're using it as inspiration. I have to give you just a little bit of setup. So this is a chapter. This is from her book, Bird by Bird, um, Some Instructions on Writing in Life. And actually, parts of it are really delightful. But she's, she's a neurotic mess because she's a neurotic person. She's a recovering drug and alcohol abuser. Um, she's just she's just an interesting character. She doesn't do the art sector any favor because believe me, she's what people think of when they think of crazy artists. Anyway, this is a chapter on writer's block. And she's talking about how even the best writers sometimes will go through this incredible period of creation and then all of a sudden it's like the writing gods have said, no, enough for you and have abandoned you. So she says, we have all been there and it feels like the end of the world. It's like a little chickadee being hit by an H-bomb. Here's the thing though, I no longer think of it as a block. I think that is looking at the problem from the wrong angle. Here's the sentence. If your wife locks you out of the house, you don't have a problem with the door. Could you just take a second on that sentence, please? If your wife locks you out of the house, you don't have a problem with the door. I mean, that's a genius sentence. Okay, I'm gonna go on. The word block suggests that you are constipated or stuck when the truth is that you're empty. As I said in the last chapter, this emptiness can destroy some writers, as do the shame and frustration that go with it. You feel that the writing gods gave you just so many good days, maybe even enough of them to write one good book and then part of another. But now you are having some days or weeks of emptiness as if suddenly the writing gods are saying, enough, don't bother me. I've given you until it hurts. Please, I've got problems of my own. The problem is acceptance, which is something we're taught not to do. We're taught to improve uncomfortable situations, to change things, alleviate unpleasant feelings. But if you accept the reality that you have been given, that you are not in a creative, produ productive creative period, you free yourself to begin filling up again. I remind myself nearly every day of something that a doctor told me six months before my friend Pammy died. Mm -hmm. This was a doctor who always gave me straight answers. When I called on this particular night, I was hoping she could put a positive slant on some distressing developments. She couldn't, but she said something that changed my life. Watch her carefully right now, she said, because she's teaching you how to live. 
I remind myself of this when I cannot get any work done, to live as if I'm dying, because the truth is we are all terminal on this bus. To live as if we are dying gives us a chance to experience some real presence. Mm. Um, I mean, that, that singular sentence, if your wife locks you out of the house, you don't have a problem with the door. Uh, I mean, it's, it's so succinct, it's so crystal clear, and it is such a, oh, oh. I mean, I read it to you and you had the exact mm. same response. Yeah. But we're here today sort of talking about the entirety of what I just read you. So this notion of um, writer's block or, or living block. You were sort of, you sort of had a blocked life. Mm. Um, and she really talks about thinking of it as something different. So do you want to comment on any of that? I'm going to sit here and drink my cocoa. So when you see this funny marshmallowy stuff, that's what's happened. I don't put marshmallows in my tea. Back to you. I knew people would be bothered. I, just, <laughs> I don't quite know how to how to carry on from there. Give me a clue of how I'm supposed to. Do you need a little prompt? I need, I need a prompt. Okay. I've got this mental image of marshmallows. The problem is acceptance, which is something we're taught not to do. We're taught to improve uncomfortable situations, to change things, alleviate unpleasant feelings. But if you accept the reality that you have been given, that you are not in a creative, product. You are not in a productive creative period, you free yourself to begin filling up again. So this idea of if if you're stuck somewhere, if something's not working, if everything you're trying isn't producing, don't think of it as I'm stuck, Th accept it. And then start to figure out, well, how do you fill yourself back up again? I think that's the interesting prompt. Okay. Um... Because we talked about you filled, unco I mean, when you first yeah. started drinking, you filled uncomfortable moments with a little alcohol, sort of that liquid courage that people talk about. Yeah, I mean, I like it like practically everyone else on the planet. When you start drinking and a lot of people can stop and say, yeah, no, this is not good for me. You know, you, you start drinking and you enjoy it. And then for, for years I had that, yes, that's how you socialize. But there was always a, hey, we're going out. And I thought, oh, we might meet someone. And I'm kind of dull so I'll have a couple of drinks of me and I'll be funny and um, that seemed to work for a while but then it got then um, it took me a long uh, well yeah for years all the way through college all the way through grad school um, my first jobs and everything it was I never had a problem with it but some and I don't know what the moment was where it suddenly became it went from being um, like a a security blanket to a crutch. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I filled up fear of dread and loneliness with it'll be all right if I have a drink then I won't worry about it without ever addressing the fear and loneliness part. Dr. Mary. Yes. Who's the only woman you've ever met sober? That would be you. <laughs> yeah. So Let's, let's take that moment, because you've had multiple serious relationships, uh, clearly all a complete loss and useless time, useless waste of his time trying to get to me, as were mine. But, um, well, uh, you know, they, they weren't. Are we gonna regale everyone now with of your Of course, past, they, they weren't relationships, lover. You're the only real woman I've ever met. They, they were mere girls. Yes. <laughs> Suddenly we've transitioned. Now we're a relationship advice giving couple. No, we're not. Good anyway, God, no. <laughs> no. Anyway, um, talk to me about that night. So I sort of constructed an event to meet Maz. Maz and I first met on a payphone, which we've talked about. If you're under 30, <laughs> they were attached to a wall and you put money in them. Mm -hmm. And it was a phone. It was a way you could talk to people in public. Anyway, Maz and I talked on a payphone, and then I didn't hear from him. So, I don't know, three or four weeks later, I was at my friend's house, who introduced us, and it was a Friday night, and I said to him, why don't you throw a party, because then Maz will come and then I can meet him. So, Maz and Peter lived in the same apartment building, so Peter said, all right, so we invited some friends, and we started to watch out Peter's windows 
for when Maz would park in the parking lot. And I what do you know? I totally forgot all of the stuff. Maz parked in the parking lot, and instead of coming upstairs, he just started to walk. And I said to Peter, well, what's happening? And he said, I bet he's walking to Duffy's, because Maz always walked to Duffy's, because at his, even at his rock, rock bottom, he never drove drunk. So I said, well, forget this. We're going to Duffy's. <laughs> and I'd never been to Duffy's. That's the point. I wasn't an alcoholic then. No, it's just 2001. I'd never been to Duffy's despite the fact that it was a block and a half from my apartment. So uh, I went home, I put on a black turtleneck and black skinny jeans and black boots and happened with Peter to show up at Duffy's. <gasps> what, who's there? It was my best acting. And that's how we actually met. So how in the world did you work up the courage to meet me sober if that was your, if you couldn't do that? Did I just give you no choice or what? Probably. Probably. <laughs> Even before I knew you, I knew you needed me to sort of run the show. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Don't get big headed now. <laughs> Let's not bury ourselves in the park. Anyway, now. back to you. Yeah, so the, that whole notion of, I mean, what, what she says in that book, you know, that what the advice is we're all terminal on this bus. You just have to. I don't know if you accept that and move on, maybe, you know, some romantic notion of understanding that there is going to be loss in life. Everyone has it. You're, you're nothing special. How you deal with it is one of the eternal questions of life that you really only have control of that. And, you know, am I going to be good or am I going to be evil? I think. Mm -hmm. How you deal with death is at least as important as how you deal with life. So... If, if alcohol creates a life block, or can, addiction, let's go with addiction, not alcohol. If addiction creates a life block, how can you shift that thinking? And instead of viewing it as something that has stopped everything, how can you accept it and, and reframe it? I mean, you have clearly moved on. You're very, very open about being an addict. Since, that's a, since that is something that you believe you are, will never not be again. Yeah. So how did you shift from this has stopped me to I accept this and I can move forward? Because you can say, well, it was rehab. But rehab only works if you do the work. So what work did you do? Oh, my God. I don't think, was it one thing or another? I... Part of it was accepting the fact that I wasn't, you know, it's oh, I'm broken, there's no hope for me. It wasn't that. I mean, I'm not, I was, I was suffering from an illness. And I think, you know, there are still some people who oh, it's not an illness, it's a choice. No, it's a disease. And if you talk to Well, enough, people can have different opinions, If you talk to you enough think? people about what they do if they are suffering from alcoholism, we all do the same behavioural traits, so that in itself makes it a disease. Really? Because symptoms are all the same. That's how you characterize a disease. Hmm. Okay. All right. I'll accept that. And the fact, I, for me, I think it was the fact that um, I wasn't alone as well. And that did help a lot. And, you know, it's a lot of people say, well, I just talk to someone. If you are suffering from this, you don't really listen to anyone because you think you're right, which is another symptom of this particular disease, as you could attest to that one as well. Mm -hmm. I could. So being sober and actually thinking about it is the first big step. Now, there are a lot of people that don't like talking about AA. There's, I've met people who have been fantastically sober for decades who don't like going to AA meetings because it labels them and that's totally fine. Th there's no real answer to this. I personally think AA for me works. Well, there's no single answer. There's no single yeah. answer. Yeah. If you don't want to go and you stay sober and you're happy, then you're, whatever you're doing is working spectacularly. So well done. So, you know, you can't be, you can't judge, you know, some people judge alcoholics if they don't go to AA meetings, which I think is odd. Well, we love to judge. I mean, I, I, I haven't gone, I've, I, I haven't given up on, I, I just dislike Zoom 
AA meetings, and I really should go back to them, but I'm really, really missing the whole point of an AA meeting for me is to go and talk about how you, how you, what you, how you're feeling at that moment, and it helps people. It's, maybe it's giving something back, and yes, you could do that by Zoom. But if not enough people go to Zoom, you're saying the same thing to the same twelve people. Yeah. I don't know. I just I thought it was a really interesting idea. But the whole thing about if the front if you come if the front door's not working, it's not the door. It's a accountability. I had to own up and say I think there's something wrong with me. Yes, you did. That's what. That's how I took. If you can't get in the front door, it's not the door. No, if your wife has locked the front door, Doors, you don't yeah. have a problem with the door. Yeah, yeah. because there's something you've got to address the root cause and not the not the, the well, physical it, manifestation. It's, it's that idea that alcohol is not the problem. Alcohol is the symptom. The problem is that you're using it yeah. to replace or to fill in um, some missing gap, you know, in somewhere in your life. So. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't really recommend Anne Lamott, although millions and millions of people do. If you like kind of hysteria all the time, she might be the girl for you. She might be the woman for you. Um, but I'm glad to be rereading the book, and I am thrilled to have reread it, if only for that one amazing sentence. And then this idea of watch how your friend is dying because she's giving you lessons for yeah. how to live. And that's It's true. She asks, she asks a little bit down in the, in the chapter. So I'm stuck. I'm judging myself. What I do is I say to myself, okay, you're dying tomorrow. How do you spend today? Suddenly that puts things in perspective and the stuff that doesn't matter slips right away. If you are feeling stuck anywhere in your life, whether it's addiction or anything else, ask yourself, pose yourself that scenario. I'm dying tomorrow. How do I want to live today? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty profound. There is that meme going around, though. If you don't like where you are or what you're doing, move. You're not a tree. You just talked about that the other I day. Know, but yeah, it comes back to it. It does. It all comes around. See, all right, plants. Mm -hmm. Found things. <laughs> Have a great Tuesday. We'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye.